Cream of Media's Polity, I'm Elan Solomons, and I'm joined today by Tando Manana to discuss his latest book, Being a Black Springbok, The Tando Manana Story. So why did you decide to tell your story through this book? Look, first and foremost, I think um, in South Africa we need a lot of good stories. That's one. Um, and mine was, was no different uh, you know, to any person's one, but it just the courage uh, that I had in particular to, to talk about my footsteps. You know, um, one looks at the Bill Gates of this world, you know, they have tremendous story. Uh, and so to the Nelson Mandela's of this world, the Tabombekis. So for me to try and walk behind their silhouette, it was something special because to put pen to paper, as you know, it's never easy. But also to open up uh, where a question is based on something that you feel you would not maybe disclose in public. But when you're writing a book and you disclose it, there's a sense of comfort in a sense that you know that you've actually thought hard about it. Uh, you are not emotional about it. You are more matured about telling your story. So that is why I decided that. Let me be part of, you know, the, the great people uh, that uh, have gone on and uh, sort of put their autobiography on the shelves in the households of many people. And, uh, you know, I'm just honored that those people that had the opportunity to go through and read the book, uh, you know, will enjoy, will take something from the book. And, and how has the book been received today? What feedback have you received? Great feedback. There's been many many people that have read the book uh, it was well received with the with the book launches that we had i think if you have an outcome of 500 people coming to a book launch it tells you that uh, you know people are quite keen to know and and and, and witness something that hasn't been witnessed before uh, i know that the steve beaker foundation have just also requested that uh, i do a book launch with them so they see me as part of uh, those people that are trendsetters not only trendsetters but also people that are an inspiration to the country. Please explain to us how your tough life growing up in New Brighton impacted on your life. Look, I mean, I put it in the book that I don't come from a rich family, but I come from a very rich background of people that have achieved uh, when, uh, you know, very few thought that, uh, you know, um, the, the tough just keeps on getting tougher and tougher. Uh, you know, I grew up with a single mother, uh, very proud of what she did in terms of uh, harnessing a guy like myself and making sure that I try and do all the right things. But however, in the background, there was a grandmother uh, who introduced me to the church, who introduced me to become an altar boy. Um, when I was caught catching up a cigarette at a toilet outside, she caught me and I never smoked again up until today. So that's life lessons to anyone that know when you're doing wrong and uh, keep trying to do the right things in life. So that was the household I grew up with. Uh, I'm the only child to my mother, uh, but I grew up with my grandmother as well. So the household at the time was two great, strong women with a lot of character. And I grew up with that. Uh, they taught me about knowing my boundaries. Uh, that led to me not being mainly uh, uh, sort of associated with the wrong people because I knew what time I'm, I needed to be at home. I knew what I needed to do in terms of my schoolwork, but also I knew the type of friends I had to be with. Uh, along the line, as I grew up into a teenager, obviously a lot of peer pressure would come in there and about, but also they were able to shape, to shape me up in good time. You know, uh, and, and, and also quite thankful, uh, if I were to put it also for a, a later family that would come into my life, the Lishu family, where I happened to stay a good four or five years in their household in Galvandale in the northern areas. They shaped up my, uh, you know, my, my, myself being and my career. Therefore, the book I dedicated to my grandmother, Louisa Manana, as well as Uncle Melvin Lishu. And on that point, connected, I mean, the book is very personal in nature. Yeah. Several chapters are dedicated to your relationship with family members, lack of relationship with yeah. your father in yeah. the early years. Yeah. Why was this so important to you that this uh, topic be discussed and in such depth? You know, if we talk of my father, is uh, when I had my first child, Tandaluit, um, there's one thing that I promised myself. I promised that she will not have to be looking for a father. She will not be having to ask friends of her father, how her father was. I will be there for her right through. I never had that opportunity. Uh, I took, for the first time, 
a picture with my father when I was 36 years of age. Now, 36 years, I know it's cruel, but I took the first picture with my daughter when she was born. And those are life lessons. Uh, I think also it is very important that if we talk of the truth and nothing but the truth, I wanted the book to be like that. I didn't want to have a curtain over some of the details. If you look at the chapter called The Absent Father, and you look at, uh, you know, at another chapter that speak of love and way to, I've learned a lot from an absent father. And many fathers nowadays, uh, you know, they don't realize the importance of being there for your child, for even being there for your family, even if you're not part of that family anymore, but just the connection, it's so important. And I appreciate that. I've taken the negatives and I've changed them into a positive, and I have a brilliant relation with my nine-year-old daughter today. You know, rugby is not a part of your early life at all. No. You're introduced to it yeah. at a uh, high school level. Yeah. Explain to us, you know, through your, your geography yes. teacher, just, just give us a sense of how that moment, you know, getting introduced to rugby and, you know, taking away from your, your, the drama world yeah. that you were very much invested in yeah. and, and eventually leads you onto the path of the Springboks. Yeah. Just, just give us a sense of, of, of that change and how it impacted your entire life? I mean, for someone like myself, very inquisitive, uh, always wanting to know more um, uh, at school, at high school in per se. I mean, being a top drama student, only in Standard 8, uh, where, you know, I had an offer from Rhodes University to do a Bachelor of Arts. Uh, I unfortunately had two more years to finish, uh, you know, uh, my matric at the time. But little did I know that sometime in March, I would meet this Mr. Martin geography teacher at a parking lot. Uh, and whilst meeting him at a parking lot, saying to me that he would want uh, me to just try and assist. Uh, he's starting a rugby side. He wants me just to assist on the game. And I said, fine, I'll do it. Um, not knowing that um, it would be love at first sight, having scoring four tries. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for a guy who just identified uh, through looking at a structure, through looking at this guy can probably do or add some value into his uh, starting 15 at the time. And um, little did I know that when, I, when, they, when Mr. Martin started the rugby team in uh, 1995, it would also be the end, at the end of 1995, of the school ever playing rugby again. So therefore, what did this mean? It was my time to be identified to the sport and introduced in the sport because a year later I would not play for my school which is St. Thomas. I would go and play for another school because our school didn't then have rugby at the time but because I'd fallen in love with rugby I was prepared to go and play for another school but also in doing so I'd become a Craven Week player in two years. I dropped drama, uh, there was bad blood between me and the drama teacher in the same school, I couldn't look, he couldn't look at me in the corridors, he didn't want to greet me in the corridors. So I had a lot of those challenges, but as a youngster, I saw nothing wrong with what I was doing. And that's how, uh, you know, my life unfolded once I was introducing the rugby system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a key theme of the book relates to the challenges faced by black rugby players at the, throughout the various structures of rugby in South Africa. Can you just elaborate on, on some of these challenges and difficulties that black rugby players face? First and foremost, in, in the book I categorically state, you know, in terms of the, the, the pay packages. You know, uh, rugby is a professional sport. We're no longer going to be talking about uh, it being an amateur sport. It is not. It mm -hmm. is a livelihood for many of the top players. Many of the top players have actually even gone overseas. And the reason they go overseas is not to play the game but is to make sure that their financial well-being is well looked after after the ending of their career. That's one. Uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm a firm believer and, and a true advocate that you've got to equal the playing fields. You know, because you play the game between the white four lines, all of you go onto the field of play. All of you are given a God-given a, a God talent. And therefore, you know, you should all be judged accordingly. Not because you're pink, you're white, you're black, you're brown. It should be a systematically a system that says category A player will earn this much, category B and C will earn this much. You know, if those are the things 
that we keep on forgetting, then rugby in this country will always be seen as for a minority few or for a better few. And for me, those are not the systems that I feel. If, I, if you read the book in terms of the administrators, they are not willing to address. You know, in, in South African rugby, you have contractual national uh, players, players that are contracted at national level. How many black players have got contracts to date? There are only two. Sia Kolisi, Bistim Tawarire. Why is that? And yet we are looking at a system where the Saru um, um, Union is talking of strategic transformation plan, the STP, which seeks to have a 50% representative of African players at the 2019 Rugby World Cup. And yet, if you look at their structures, there's only two players of color who's got a national contract. Now, it cannot be fair when you've contracted 16 to 18 players and yet you only have two. It just tells you the gap keeps on widening up. We have to try and make sure and say we want to move in the right direction. We, we, we don't want to use, the, they should not be using the government for their own benefits in terms of if they're looking for the Rugby World Cup to be hosted. They, would, they must be sincere at categorically changing the entire system of the game so that people understand where Saro is going at with the game, making the game available for a kid in Soweto and for a kid uh, in, 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 in Santin or in Bryanston. But for me, I just get a sense that they're missing out on a point and also opportunities that would also give mm -hmm. black players that opportunity to also make a good living out of the sport. So obviously you think that there's flaws fundamentally in the franchise and junior and junior levels. I mean, Which are not challenged. The problem is, who wants to challenge those uh, flawed situation? Uh, are, they, are there bold enough administrators that would go on and saying that this is what is currently happening? It's flawed system. So and so is benefiting, you know, unduly to the system. No one is willing to do so. Why? Why then do you get involved when at some point you're going to neglect what is so core and fundamental to society? And that is leveling the playing fields across the board. That is my worry. And uh, it's a worry that, I mean, if I look differently, uh, I look at guys like Ali Baha, for example, the extent that he went to, to making sure guys like the Makai Antinis, you know, became world-class players, which they did. That's an administrator that cared about the game, but not only about the game, the livelihood of the players, the support, you know, the support system, because knowing that if the player does not have someone outside for that support system, he is still there to just call on him and just motivate and give him the much uh, needed uh, encouragement as a person uh, that is not family related, but also knows him, his role as an administrator. We don't find that anymore. We find people are more worried in terms of what they are getting and what they receive from this game instead of what the game is giving to the players. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you then touch on the issue of overt and subtle racism at the highest level, the Springbok level, mm -hmm. and particularly about you know, not respecting of traditions, of black yeah. traditions yeah. and culture. Yes. Explain that to us and, and kind of give me a blueprint yeah. of how this can be addressed in a meaningful way to ensure that fundamentally the black tradition is respected and that black players feel comfortable in the spring box. I like your question. I've always said as a black person, you have to be comfortable with, with your skin color. That's one. Secondly, we all come from different backgrounds. Different backgrounds uh, also entails different cultures. Exactly what happened to me was, for the first time, we had an African tosser in the Springbok setup. For the first time, I wanted to address where I was coming from. However, because of, at the time, Springbok was seen to be an Africana sport and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. We will do as we please. The mere fact that if you look at the initiation, it was never there. Nick Mallet, the previous coach, had scraped it out. But the players at the time, the US van der Vestazen, the Andre Fenter, the Mark Andrews, had felt that they wanted to bring back the, the initiation thing, which you look at Jake White, you look at Nick Mallet, they all agree with what I've been saying. It's a barbaric act. It's a barbaric act which seeks not to only uh, serve their own interests, but it does not serve the other people's interests. If people do go there, they know that they don't want to go there, but they have to force themselves into a culture which does not belong to them. And that is wrong. And I hope 
I honestly hope that with the current crop of players, they should learn, but before learning, they should look at themselves. Are they comfortable with their own background, with their own cultures, before they go out and want to try and accept or push themselves to accept other cultures? Because if they push, then it's not right. But they need to embrace the different cultures in order for them to always, at the back of their mind, know that we come from different backgrounds, but with one uh, goal in mind, and that is to achieve greatness. Do you believe that enough is being done at the franchise level, junior level, and the like, to empower black rugby players to reach their full potential? You know, the, what worries me is this year I had an opportunity to go to St. Sithians in Johannesburg um, and seeing that there is two fields that were used throughout the, the entire Craven Week. And then I went back and I questioned, was a tournament like this, uh, which is the top crop of high school boys ever hosted at a township? The answer was no. At the colored community, the answer was no. What makes this tournament to be such a special tournament that it cannot be played in Soweto? Because you only need two fields. Mm -hmm. St. Scythians had over, uh, I don't know how many fields I counted there. Uh, you know, it's a good school, it's a, it's a very expensive school, but they only needed two. And the people that were there were of all races. However, it remains to be an elite tournament for high school, which is the Craven Week. And that's where I differ, is at Craven Week you have a 50-50 representative. You have your black kids, you have colored kids, you have your white kids. You have, you know, you, that's, that's what you have. But bluntly, one can say that, but why isn't then the tournament taken to the grassroots uh, level area? To make sure that we go to a location or a township, we'll make sure that the facility is of the same caliber, we'll work on it because next year that's the tournament. It's never been done before. And for me it worries me that we're not looking at, 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 at the real transformation yet. We are only looking at just making it a window shopping type of we're doing this for the game we've spent half a billion on development but where is the fruits there's no ways that you can invest over half a billion in development and there are very few people that you can handpick and say these are the people that we've been able or managed to get out of the system and make them spring box or make them junior spring box for me that's the thing is if you want to be honest and grow the sport go to where the masses are where there are people that you will get gems of players. I mean, today we speak of, uh, you know, Sia Colisi. He hails from a Zwede township, but he was taken because he was head, I mean, he was spotted at an at, at, at a under-13 tournament. He got an opportunity to go to Greha. But the, the real deal is he's coming from that impoverished background from Zwede township. Kevin Bosch, who's just been selected to the Springbok squad, he hails from Alexandria. Which is, a t which is a small town outside of Port Elizabeth. He was also spotted at uh, the Grand Como uh, tournaments, and uh, he was given then the same as Sia Colisi an opportunity to go to Grey PE. Where is he today? So are you saying that only then a few will benefit from that? Or are we saying that whatever we invest, we need to invest in the rural of the rural area, we make sure that we do a proper structure of identifying talent, but also we don't necessarily have to take them to the Model C schools. We have to make sure that we, we build and develop this, the sport in itself mm -hmm. uh, within where they come from, because it's easier to go to. The, the comfort zone is there, it's, it's just a walk in the park, but then get more people involved to make sure that we get enough uh, in the tank, because South Africa has an abundance of talent. That cannot be taken out at all. We've got more talented players than the New Zealanders. But however, the New Zealanders look well after their own that uh, can make it up to the all-black level. You now sit on the Eastern Cape Rugby Union's Provincial Affairs Committee and its Provincial Selection Panel. What are the challenges that you've identified and what are the, the measures that you put in place yeah. to address them? Look, I think... Um, at Eastern Province, uh, because that's where it started for me. I played all my youth rugby for Eastern Province before going to Griquas in Kimberley. 
Uh, and when I was invited, it was I could not say no uh, this year. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to plow back. So the knowledge that I had was uh, immediately to find the flaws within the structures which we did because at the time in Eastern Province everything was about the Eastern Province Academy. All the 120 clubs affiliated to Eastern Province were neglected and immediately we call on uh, trials. We give each and every child an opportunity to impress the selectors on the day. And I'm proud to say that from a team that last year was fully representative of academy boys, this year's team has got a 50-50 representative of both club players and also some from the academy. That's under 19. Same as in the under 21 uh, level. However, for Curry Cup, because of the situations that they find themselves of without anything after the Chicky Watson saga, is opportunities now will be given to purely club players. Meaning that it's at amateur type level, so there's a lot of work because the players have got to go to work, from work they've got to go and train. It's no longer a system of having professional players who purely will have time to train in the morning or in the afternoon. So these are the challenges that you face. Obviously you'll always face them after such a crisis has happened. I think also the people in the PE area as well, we spoke about the, 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 the cowards or the cowardness of some administrators who then allowed over the eight years for the system to be where it is currently, which now we'll have to start working together, uh, putting the building blocks together uh, to make uh, one united wall in taking back, uh, you know, uh, EP Rugby to its uh, former glory days when it was once called the Mighty Elephants. So those are systems that are in place. However, I cannot do anything and everything on my own. Uh, I require uh, the committee that is involved with. From there, I require the clubs to also give us a hand in making sure that as we try uh, to change things, they are there and support and giving us all the, 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 the immediate support structures that we, we require, but also give us enough time, uh, two to three years. Uh, to make sure that, you know, from where we were three years ago, this is where we're going and making sure that we keep our locally based talent in the Eastern Cape and Eastern Province. And then just in conclusion, how would you describe the current state of South African rugby, broadly speaking? Are you happy with where things stand? And what would you like to see change? <sighs> I'd, I'd definitely, you know, sometimes you, you get tired of being too critical. Uh, you also have to applaud at times. And, and, and that is what I, I wish to do to your answer. One, uh, I'm happy that uh, South African rugby are able now to all of a sudden, uh, after a very bad year, uh, are able to, to attract sponsors. I think in any sporting federation, you know, when you see that you have the support of the corporate world, there's a smile on your face. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, that's very important. But uh, in terms of uh, from the Springboks downwards and to all the franchise in Super Rugby, I feel plenty could be, could be done. Um, it's just a pity that we have a certain few that wants to hold on to power. We have a certain few that believe that uh, everything it starts and ends with them. Uh, by doing so, you have this dictatorship of, um, of people that are running the game. Uh, for me, it worries me that um, we, we're, not, we're not getting and we're not achieving uh, what we're seeking to achieve. Yes, it might look on black and white that uh, this is what we're looking for. But I'm looking at, if one looks at the franchises, uh, they need to transform, um, they need to make sure that each and every kid gets an opportunity to get to that level. Saro have been their own, um, uh, also one if one looks, have been their own nightmare uh, in a sense that um, their communication to people like us on the ground level, the media, uh, the clubs, the province, have not actually been at, 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 a, at a standard where you know you have the robust dialogue because everything is done electronically. So they just give you what they want to give you and they'll answer when they want to give you. And I, and I feel that's not openness. 
uh, if you want to be open and you want to know exactly what your people want, you have to give them the platform to challenge you and challenge you and have answers for those challenges. You want to have an open, robust debate on certain issues. Uh, currently, uh, at the Eastern Province, uh, SARU is running affairs for a union. It's not supposed to be like that. The union should be running their own affairs. Secondly, the union is not getting the grant of one million that they're supposed to be getting. Why is that? Why are some getting and some are not getting? And, and, and those are the things that people like yourself Alan, are not seeing. You know, you would see that there's a F and B that has just come on board. But fine. You don't know what is happening at different unions. I mean, we know that Western Province, Remgro has pulled out and they want their 40 plus million back. So they will also be in a position now to struggle to find another investor. And yet SARU is there. And SARU is the motherboard. What are they doing to make sure that these unions are kept afloat so that the burden is not on SARU? The burden is not on them to be assisting and wanting to be part of a union. But the burden should be to try and facilitate and make sure that investors are sent to the right different provinces if they are there. So therefore meaning that obviously there's the hold on to power, uh, which is quite, um, I think it's quite, it's quite common in this country. I think with time, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we will get it right. We'll get the right people. Uh, to finally harness and also make sure that our rugby is, you know, is going in the right. We, we, we are a two-time Rugby World Cup winning nation. So we're not far off uh, from the world's best. However, we can be the best again if we all pull in one direction. And I certainly hope we will. I certainly hope that we'll find people that are interested to come in and support and be that support structure that is required. That was Tando Manana discussing his book, Being a Black Springbok, The Tando Manana Story.